There was a very, uh, I think, vicious campaign led by uh, one or two critics and also by uh, one or two Tory MPs, in particular the, a man called Ivor Stanbrook, who was quoted in the Daily Mail as saying that it was the IRA entry at Cannes. This is before the film had been seen, of course, by anybody. Um, and that mud st stuck. The furor caused by Ken Loach's film about Northern Ireland, Hidden Agenda, is just one in a long line of controversies that have dogged his career. Despite a string of international awards and being recognised throughout the world as one of Britain's foremost filmmakers, Loach has fought a constant battle to get his work shown in Britain. From his early success, Kez, in 1969, right through to his most recent film, Riff Raff, there have been precious few screenings in a small number of cinemas, and outright bans have been imposed on many of his television documentaries. Well, Ken, I noticed that uh, one of the clips they've just shown is from Kez, which I suppose is still your most famous film of all. Well, you might deny that, but uh, it's certainly one of the most popular ones you ever made. Was there any trouble in making it? And B, was there any trouble in actually having it distributed? Um, well, as you know, you, because you were very helpful at the time, we, we had, did have a bit of a problem in getting it shown, um, which is a, a problem that's uh, been with us uh, for many years. But um, yes, it, they didn't show it in the London cinemas first. It opened in Doncaster. Um, and it opened in Doncaster because when the Americans who'd paid for it first saw it, they said they understood Hungarian better. <laughs> and um, so we, there was a problem in understanding what they were saying. Right, and it's Manchester United versus Spurs in this important fifth round cup tie here at Old Trafford. And it's the fair head slightly bowling chant until kick off. The football scene. Why did you choose that? Um, well, it, it's. Um, I, I enjoy football really, and um, so it's just an excuse to watch a bit of football. And uh, also, the um, it brings back a few memories of the, the lads who were in it, who were a right bunch of villains, and um, and the man who played the sportsmaster, Brian Glover, who was a very and is a very funny man, um, and. Uh, in fact, it was a, the match was partly improvised. I mean, he uh, and Brian played a big part in that. In, uh, in wind and I was winding the kids up to wind him up. No one moves till this ball kicked. Just watch this, Guthrie. Right, Clegg. Bad you are. Well, they move. They move. They move. We never really worked much with uh, with amateurs. They were always entertainers of one sort or another. Mm. Um, it's just that they weren't 
uh, necessarily theater actors. Mm. And then this Brian was, at the time we made it, was, was teaching English at a school up the road. Um, and also um, working as a, as a wrestler under the name of Leon Arras France. Um, <laughs> and uh, he'd been, you may have noticed, he got a bandage on his knee. <coughs> and when he came back, he'd, he'd been wrestling in France. And um, when he came back to do the film, he'd say, you know, I can't do this because I've, I've, I've done my knee in. And he'd been in France and he'd been, you know, the French have, or they had, open loose with a, a hole. And he'd, he'd had a piggly, <laughs> strenuous bout the night before uh, and had slightly pulled the muscle in his leg. When he was um, hovering over this uh, <laughs> French loo, he was actually stricken with the, the muscle which he'd pulled the night before and had to be held away by uh, a, a group of passing Frenchmen. And um, <laughs> so he, he came back in a state of some disarray and fortunately we managed to patch him up and he did the film, but it was touch and go really. Your next clip is from a very controversial documentary, Whose Side Are You On? And what I seen that day is nothing. You can never call the police, police in this country because they were running into the crowd with horses and buttons about a yard long and thrashing out at anyone and everything had <coughs> moved, regardless what you'd done. If he was only standing still, they would have hit you to the ground. And I was listening on telly and the, and the, the commentator was saying, the police use their trenches liberally. Well, if he calls that liberally, he must have made the biggest understatement I've ever heard. Uh, the, the minor strike was uh, a colossal event, I think, and we met some extraordinary people, extraordinarily heroic, and uh, people who made great sacrifices. Um, and it was a privilege to be able to to make the film. And seeing it again, you know, you're reminded both of the the heroism of the people who 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 waged that strike, and of also the extent of the betrayal uh, that they suffered at the hands of the the Labour leaders at the time. Um, that um, particular section is um, about the brutality they suffered at the hand of the police, um, and which is still largely unacknowledged. Um, and I, I saw it at first hand, like many other people. Uh, and I saw uh, British policemen uh, behaving like thugs, as they say in the film. Why is Daddy crying, Mum? Has he got a pooly head? Was it done by men in blue when they dragged us out of bed? No, son. He's shedding tears of pride in the medals he has won. Nay, lad, they're not across his chest. They're out there, every one. I tried the BBC and I tried uh, Melvin Bragg of the South Bank show and said, um, because he was, had an arts programme, I said, let's do a film about the songs and the poems that are being written. Because, um, I mean, it was an absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary year. When Melvin Bragg and Nick Ellis, uh, who turned out to be the hitman of the South Bank show, saw it, they said, we can't show that. Uh, we'll show it if you take out the shots of the police uh, or you reduce the amount of time in which the police are seen to be uh, beating up the miners and we said well that is actually what it's about that's what they're writing about you know and if if the if the south bank show or the film is to be about the interaction between um artifacts and the events that that uh, inspire them or provoke them then here is an absolutely classic case you know if this was nicaragua or if it was chile or if it was vietnam you know we wouldn't be having this discussion but anyway they wouldn't show it and um which I thought was very surprising. But uh, you wouldn't deny that you're definitely a political filmmaker. Or well, would you, perhaps you would? Um, well, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it, it can be a rather glib term, you mm. know, and a rather, uh, rather But there's a European facile. tradition of political filmmaking to mm. which you belong rather than to the English school of filmmaking, perhaps. 
Yes, I mean, I've, that's true. And I mean, the, the, the writers I've worked with and uh, the, the producers and the people have, have by and large shared a, a point of view, um, you know, which we've worked on on the film. But yeah, I guess political subjects have, are very compulsive. Mm -hmm. And you would say you were definitely fr of the left. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so, I mean, no, I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not attacking yes, you, by the way. I mean, the, the fiction we live with is that there is an objective uh, viewpoint uh, mm. by which we're judged. And that, of course, isn't, as we know, isn't the case. Um, and we know there, are, there is a point of view every time we, read, we hear the news mm. or every time we, we hear it on the radio. There's a point of view being expressed. And, uh, and particularly on Ireland, if you, if you mm. try and make a film on Ireland which is not about suppressing terrorism, then you're deemed to be, as you say, um, uh, uh, somehow endorsing, an, uh, um, endorsing the IRA or something. Did you bring the tip? Yeah. 11.69. I'm sorry? 800 years. That's how long we've been fighting for independence. Sword, famine, burning, hanging, shooting, transportation. We've had it all. Who's Harris? Oh, it's better he tells you himself. There's a car behind us. Is it following us? We'll soon find out. Something wrong here. Something wrong. Get down! Get down! When Hidden Agenda came out, um, which, um, as you know, I mean, deals with uh, dirty tricks in Ireland uh, by the British, there was a leader in the Times about it which said that. Um, that the public must not be confused between fact and fiction. That same week, uh, the Klaus von Bülow film had come out, uh, where Jeremy Irons impersonated um, von Bülow. And that was, that was literally a reenactment of something that had supposedly happened. I mean, that was, mm. in a sense, a straight reenactment of a, of a factual event. Um, and there was no sense that that wasn't included in their comments at all. Mm. And so I think what, what they're worried about isn't whether it's fact or fiction, but what it's actually saying. Those people who criticize you would say, perhaps, that the best films you've made have been the least overtly political ones, which a lot of people can enjoy and still get a, a mes political message from without even perhaps knowing it. And that your least successful films are films like Fatherland, which have a very, quite a heavy political message, which is, is stated even in captions on the, uh, on the screen. Would you, would you agree with that, or would you say it's just because people are not used to any kind of political cinema in this country? No, I think you're probably right, actually. I think you're probably right. Um, I, th I, think it, I think it's... Um, I, I think there's a difference with documentaries. I think mm. documentaries, in a sense, can be like pamphlets, and mm. films... T can be more like novels. And um, there, there's occasions, and I felt particularly in the early 80s, that there were occasions when there wasn't time, what was happening was so extreme, there wasn't time to develop a script, mm. um, raise the money, make the film, try and get it shown, which can take three or four years. That what was needed was, were, were pamphlets. Um, and I really misjudged the situation because they all got stopped. Um, but, um, but I think, I think you're right in that, that if, if ever a, a project is, driv is not driven by the human experience, then it, it's diminished. And I think that's, that's true. Is there any point in going on making political films that are not shown, I mean? Um, well, um, I mean, as we said earlier, I mean, I, I hope, you know, it's political with a small p. And, yes, and, of course. Um, I mean, I hope, you know, it's where all human life is there, I hope. Um, but um, I think it's, I think in a way it's something you do because you do it in the end. Uh, and because you've, you know, well, you, you have a, a whole uh, web of working relationships that you, that you feel compelled to keep going and, uh, and want to keep going.
It's the writers and uh, the people who've worked the, with you. Yes, and, and I mean, every film is a series of collaborations, you know, of, and that's one of, that's what makes it such a, such a, a joyful profession to work in. Although uh, you say it's a collaboration, and of course it is a collaboration, you do bring something very special to your films, and you, and you, <laughs> I mean, you can go on denying it till kingdom come, but everybody here knows that. Um, well, I don't know, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is it? Do you think it's your? Do you think it's a kind of a documentary approach? Do you think it's um, a kind of honesty of vision, or what do you hope it is? Put it that way. Um, well, I mean, I, I hope that uh, when people see it, they say, yes, that is how things are, you know. Um, I hope that's what people are able to say, you know. And that, that if that's how things are, then, then there are certain consequences. Um, because it's, the, it's what you choose to show um, kind of leads the audience to have some sense of why, why it's worth seeing or what the consequences or what the importance is or the significance or what the ramifications of it are. But How do you actually get these effects? Do you actually have improvisation? Do you uh, talk a lot with the actors? How do you actually operate that may be a little different from, uh, um, say, your average film is, is operating? Um, you don't use sets very much for a start. Um, not, not, not built sets, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, try and shoot on location. But um, I think the, it's... I think what, what is very important always is the first time you hear something. I mean, if, you as a, if we're playing a scene, the first time I say something to you, you just absorb it in a way you never do again. So I think, I think not rehearsing is quite important. Yeah. Um, I mean, on Riff Raff, we had half a day's rehearsal with uh, the lads who were mainly were building workers or ex-building workers, and, um, and we, we spent it shifting a load of sand and cement from one <laughs> part of the site to the other part of the site so that mm -hmm. they, they got a few calluses on their hands again. Um, uh, how did you manage the bathroom scene, which I think is one of the clips? Um, um, that we're going to see? Oh, yeah. yes. Well, um, th th this is where um, a lad takes a bath in the show flat in the, on, the, on the building site, and um, um, the, the few people being shown around the flat at the same time. Bathroom here, which I think you'll find very impressive. Get out of there! Happy, happy there were three, these these three um, Saudi Arabian ladies who were being shown around. And uh, we hadn't explained to them what, what was going to be in the bathroom <laughs> when, they, when they opened the door. Um, and um, we, we had mentioned to Ricky that he might get a, he might get a visitor. And uh, <laughs> he'd, uh, he had the loofah strategically placed <laughs> for the first take. <laughs> the story of the distribution of Riff Raff is one of the most appalling stories I think I've ever heard. Um, shown uh, for one week here, uh, otherwise it wouldn't have been shown at all. Uh, critics come out saying, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, uh, then it, then uh, Channel 4 takes it to Cannes, where it gets the International Critics Prize. Later on, it gets the, uh, what is virtually the European Oscar. Uh, and then it's sort of limped out uh, after all the critics have had their say months beforehand. I mean, this is a classic way of 
how not to distribute a film which could have been extremely popular. I've never known an audience which has come out not liking that film. I think that happened because there is no confidence in British films. We have no confidence in our own culture um, because it's actually been driven out by, uh, by the workings of the free market. Uh, because we, the cinema is a market. Uh, the, in that situation, the, the strongest product will win. Um, the one which is geared to exploiting the market, which American films are, um, very well promoted, very well researched, um, so that uh, there is what the market wants, the American film delivers. Um, and in that situation, European films, British films, are driven to the wall. I mean, it's the same in cars, it's the same in anything. And, and I think what it shows in homes, I mean, what it shows is the free market doesn't work. Does anybody like to ask mm -hmm. a question? Yes. I have a question. I'm interested to know how you go about directing commercials. Someone's interested to know how you go about doing commercials. I'd done a series of documentaries which had got banned, and it was... There was, a, there was about a year or so when I seemed to, like everything I'd done, even a stage play got pulled out of the Royal Court at the last minute. And there seemed to be a point where everything I'd touched actually turned to dross. And, um, I mean, that had obviously certain consequences, professional, financial, and so on. And uh, I, I was asked and, um, if there was a possibility of doing a couple of commercials. Uh, which I did. I feel very ambivalent about it, uh, to be honest. Um, I think it's, it has some small benefits in that you, if you haven't stood behind the camera for two years or two and a half years, I think it was the case, you really begin to lose your nerve, you know, and you begin to wonder, shall I actually know what to say? You know? The difficulty with this is you can't ask the most important question about which you need to ask about any film, which is what, what's the center of what the film is saying? You know, and you can't ask that. Um, and that's uh, something I don't feel happy with. We've talked about the fact that, you know, there's no indigenous British cinema, which I agree with, but what about television? You've had a great success on television. And television is, I mean, it's enormously important. I mean, it is is it three hours of our life every day or something on average? I mean, it is, it is colossal. But I guess the point about television is that if you make a film in it, you're operating in a very hostile environment because it seems to me television is primarily, broadcasting is primarily about social control. Let me ask one last question about your future plans. Are you going to make films or television from now on? Does Riff Raff help you to make some more films? Oh, yeah, Riff Raff helped enormously. Um, and... Um, because, um, you know, because of what's happened in Cannes, as you were saying, and because of what happened in Berlin, um, that made a colossal difference. And, uh, but, I mean, in, in a sense, it's one industry, whether they show on the screen first and then television, it mm. is in the end one industry. And, I mean, it, it would be very nice to be able to sometimes to make documentaries and sometimes yes. to make films because that the one enriches the other. The, the experience of doing one is... Is, is very invigorating. Um, but you are making another one now, or shortly? Yeah, all being well. And another one after that, I believe? Well, yes, I hope so. Well, <laughs> thank God for that. <laughs> Ken, thank you very much indeed. OK, thank you. Thank you. Come on then.